the seventh Sunday of Easter. In these days between Ascension and Pentecost, we gather with the disciples in the upper room, waiting for the Spirit to transform the church around the world. In today's Gospel, Jesus prays for his followers and for their mission in his name. Amid religious, social, and economic divisions, we seek the unity that Jesus had with his Father. Made one in baptism, we go forth to live our faith in the world, eager for the unity that God intends for the whole human family. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. On the order of the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario, we have temporarily closed our church building and have suspended all gatherings. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, for recording a prelude and postlude for us today. Your music is always a beautiful and important part of our worship at St. Paul's, and we appreciate your gift to us this day. On this, the seventh Sunday of Easter, every year our church asks us to pray for Jerusalem and the Holy Land. So we will do so today using prayers prepared by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Thank you for watching out for one another. I'll be checking in by phone as much as I'm able with many of our members. If you need assistance, please phone the church office and leave a message and I'll arrange for help. I check frequently for messages. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to gather in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side. And on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in the font and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness grace and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We are gathered to remember whose we are. We come as we are with questions and doubts. We are gathered to be reminded who it is that makes our hearts glad. We come seeking paths of life and fullness of joy. We are gathered as part of God's people, aware of those who are no longer living and those missing. We come in hope, for in God's presence there is fullness of joy. Let us pray. O God of glory, your Son Jesus Christ suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The children's time, Stronger Together. And I'm so very glad that you're here because I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. So I have this twig, this ordinary everyday twig 
Who thinks that I can break the twig in half? Who said no? I heard you. Here it goes. Ta -da! But what if I got a whole bunch of twigs like this? And I've got them uh, wrapped with a couple of rubber bands so that I can't cheat. But do you think that taking this whole group of twigs, I can break the group of twigs? Let's see. Can I have a drum roll, please? Maybe with your mouth or with your uh, clapping on your, your lap. Brrr, drum roll. Can I break them? You know what? I don't think I can. <laughs> no way. I broke a few pieces off, but I cannot break that group of twigs. Uh, it was impossible to break the group of twigs when they were in a bunch. And that shows that we're stronger together. Jesus' disciples knew that too. And so after Jesus left them and went back to be with God, the disciples gathered together and they got strengthened in prayer. In the same way, we're strengthened when we gather together, even when we're apart, by joining together in prayer. Let's do that now, as I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands up and open to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and head bowed, eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter in Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. So now let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to show us your love and to teach us about you. Thank you for calling us to be strengthened by being together. Help us always to meet with you in prayer, that we may be equipped to do your will and your work. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. Jesus' Companions at Prayer After His Departure Today's reading is part of the introduction to the narrative of the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. These verses tell of the risen Lord's conversation with his disciples on the eve of his ascension, in which he promises that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the apostles were together for the last time, they asked, Master, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time? Jesus told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. These were Jesus' last words. As they watched, he was taken up and disappeared in a cloud. They stood there, staring into the empty sky. Suddenly, two men appeared in white robes. They said, you Galileans, why do you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? This very Jesus who was taken up from among you to heaven will come as certainly and mysteriously as he left. So they left the mountain called Olives and returned to Jerusalem. It was a little over half a mile. They went to the upper room they had been using as a meeting place. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. They agreed they were in this for good, completely in prayer, the women included also Jesus' mother, Mary, and his brothers. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Christ's prayer for his disciples. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prays to his heavenly Father, asking that those who continue his work in this world will live in unity. The Holy Gospel according to John. 
Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said these things to the disciples about having courage because he has conquered the world. Then raising his eyes in prayer, Jesus said, Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your son so the son in turn may show your bright splendor. You put him in charge of everything human so he might give real and eternal life to all in his charge. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what you had assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place. Then you gave them to me, and they have now done what you said. They know now, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them and they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours and yours mine, and my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you have conferred as a gift through me, so they can be one heart and mind. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, this is now our 10th at-home worship. It's been longer than most of us anticipated. And even though President Trump on Friday ordered all churches to go back to worshiping together, here in Canada, there's no end in sight for our worship at home order. So like the children on a long car ride, we ask, are we there yet? In today's first reading, the disciples also want to know when. When will God restore the kingdom of Israel? Today's first reading begins, Master, are we there yet? The expectation of virtually all Jews was that when the Messiah came, he would deliver Israel from Roman oppression and become king over a Jewish nation, reunited and sovereign, as it had been under kings Saul, David, and Solomon, and again briefly under the Maccabees. The disciples want to know when Jesus will deliver them from Roman oppression. But Jesus responds, you don't get to know the time when God will bring in the kingdom. Timing is the Father's business. God's kingdom is coming in and through the work of Jesus, not by taking people away from this world into heaven, but by transforming things within this world, bringing the sphere of earth into the presence and under the rule of heaven itself. Scholars point out to us that Jesus' message was primarily about the kingdom of God, the reign of God. Now, of course, a kingdom is a place where a king rules. But Jesus ushered in the kingdom in a radically unexpected way. Jesus declared the kingdom of God as a present reality that could be experienced by those he taught and to whom he ministered. Jesus' teaching also assumed the kingdom was a future reality in addition to being present. Here's another example where reality is best described as both and rather than either or. The reign of God is both a present reality and a future hope. To borrow the phrase made popular by George Eldon Ladd, the kingdom of God is already, not yet. 
God's kingdom has a dual dimension. Jesus initiated the kingdom on earth, and wherever God's will is carried out, the kingdom is a reality. The kingdom, however, has not been fully manifested in Jesus' day, nor has it been fully manifested in ours. We do not yet live in a world where God's will is a complete reality. We feel the tension of experiencing God's kingdom in our lives and communities before it's fully realized. We still see unbelief, brokenness, and sin, telling us God's will is not yet fully expressed. When Jesus prayed, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as in heaven, he asked that God would bring the experience of heaven to earth. Through Jesus, God's reign, rule, and power are available to us today, not just in the distant future. With the disciples, we want to know when the reign of God will fully come. Jesus doesn't answer their or our question. Instead, Jesus says, What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. In the world of the first century, when someone was enthroned as king, that new authority would take effect through heralds going off throughout the territory in question with the news, we have a king. This was always proclaimed as good news. And this is what Jesus is telling them they must now do. You're asking about the kingdom, he says. You're asking when it will come about, when Israel will be exalted as the top nations, with the nations of the world being subject to God through his vindicated people. Well, in one sense, it has already happened. Jesus is saying, because in my own death and resurrection, I have already been exalted as Israel's representative. In another sense, it is yet to happen, because we still await that time when the whole world is visibly and clearly living under God's just and healing rule. But we are now living in between those two points, and you must be my witnesses from here to the ends of the world. The apostles are to go out as heralds, not of someone who may become king at some point in the future, but of the one who has already been appointed and enthroned. These were Jesus' last words. As they watched, Jesus was taken up and disappeared in a cloud. With his earthly ministry accomplished, Christ returns to God the Father, but he sends the Holy Spirit to make possible the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus leaves them physically, but promises to remain with them and us through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples then meet together for prayer. They went to the upper room they had been using as a meeting place. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They agreed they were in this for good, completely together in prayer, the women included, also Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers. God's new community, the church, is an inclusive community devoted to prayer so that they could continue to be connected with Jesus and do his will and his work. We want to know when. Instead, we're given how. The reign of God comes in the present as we proclaim the gospel, the good news of God's loving and forgiving presence, now and not yet. Today's first reading is Jesus' final words to his disciples before he ascends and leaves them physically. There's a similar message and setting in today's gospel reading. In the gospel reading are also Jesus' last words, but just before his crucifixion, rather than just before his ascension. In Jesus' final prayer in today's gospel, overheard by the disciples, Jesus defines the concept of eternal life, the gospel of John's version of the reign of God. 
In today's Gospel reading, Jesus says, And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Here and throughout the Gospel of John, eternal life is described not as something that happens in the future, not as something that is this unimaginable pie-in-the-sky sort of thing. Rather, eternal life is to know God and the one who God has sent. Christians point to the Father the way Jesus pointed to the Father, that our actions of grace, justice, good, righteousness, king, kindness, peace, these are all glimpses of what God intends for the world, and these point to God. What better way to be in unity with one another, whatever our circumstances in life might be? Eternal life is knowing God through Jesus. But in the Gospel of John, knowing is not a head thing. Knowing is a synonym for relationship. So eternal life is here and now in this relationship that we have with Jesus and with God. In a time of pandemic, when those patterns that we had in place of maintaining the relationship with Jesus, patterns such as going to church, that relationship is, attacked, is intact. It hasn't gone away. Jesus continues, I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. This term glorify is really quite simple in John. It's to make visible the presence of God. And so this is our charge going forward. We will be involved in the activity of glorifying God and what that means is making visible the presence of God for all, so that all can see God. And according to the Gospel of John, Jesus' chief glorification of God was on the cross, where the world could see God's great love. We want to know when when the kingdom or reign of God will come in its fullness, when the pandemic prohibition of congregational worship will end. But instead of being told when, we're told how. In our actions of grace, of justice, of good, of righteousness, kindness, of peace, glimpses of what God intends for all the world. So instead of being told when, we're told how. And we're told who, through the power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit beside us, to encourage and to empower us in our mission to make visible the love of the invisible God. May we too, like the disciples, be devoted in prayer so that we are able to witness and to announce the kingdom and reign of God in words and in loving deeds until the kingdom of God comes in all its fullness. Amen. The prayers today are adapted from those prepared by Pastor Rick Price of Lunenburg Lutheran Parish in Nova Scotia. Celebrating the victory of love over death, we offer our prayers to God, saying, God of resurrection, and responding, hear our prayer. God, for whom we wait, it is hard to wait. We crave an end. We desire fulfillment. Breathe your patience into our hearts. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God, for whom we wait, you command us to wait, to pause, to let go, and not be in charge. Breathe faith into our hearts. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God for whom we wait. Your church is anxious about the future, and it is easy to give in to impatience. Breathe your love into our community. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God for whom we wait. We pray for others who wait the sick waiting for treatment, the hungry waiting for food, refugees waiting for safety, 
families waiting for reconciliation, the poor waiting for justice. Remind all the needy of your presence as we call them to mind. Breathe your healing into our world. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God, for whom we wait, you came among us as a baby in Bethlehem, sharing in our humanity, our sufferings, and our problems. Today, your world is groaning with physical distancing, with mental stress, with loss of jobs, and with loss of hope. Yet you are a God of hope. You are here with us, and you are with the people of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Give us comfort in the midst of chaos. Give us hope in the midst of suffering, and faith in the midst of mourning. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God for whom we wait, in the midst of political conflict and deteriorating peace talks, we thank you for faithful leaders in the Holy Land especially Bishop Azar of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, and Bishop Suhail of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem. Give them strength to speak out against injustices which eliminate the security and freedom of people. Give us that same courage to open our eyes to what is needed to protect those who are most vulnerable. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God, for whom we wait, you are a God of peace, and yet we are not always peaceful people. Let your people strive for peace. With the people of the Holy Land, we ask that you reign your peace upon us and upon our land. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. God, for whom we wait, it is hard to wait. Remind us again that we are waiting for you. Breathe hope into all creation. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray this in the name of our risen and living Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. receive the blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen, just as he said. Go in peace, Share the good news. Thanks be to God.